God is good. All the time. Good morning and thank you for coming once again to our worship service and like I said before, I, I say before we'll get started and others will come, but uh, um, we'll, let's start with our call to worship and if you would stand we'll have our call to worship from Psalm 100. For the Lord is good, his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 105. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you allow us to come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this season. We thank you, Lord, for this nation where we have the freedom to worship. And we thank you, Lord, for your evident blessing on us. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us now through this time that we gather together. May our worship be as, as good as your grace and love. And, and we can't match that, Lord, but we can through the power of your Holy Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts. Help us, Lord, so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn this morning is Victory in Jesus, number 415. You may be seated. Well, each uh, these past weeks, I've asked how Lily May is doing, but she's here with us today. So, <laughs> I very much appreciate walking through that door. That meant a lot to me, and I also want to thank everybody for their cards and. Everything they did. Uh, Liz went home last Monday, so I can now do a few more. 
more things on my own. Yeah. There's not somebody there constantly. And, uh, but I really appreciate all she did and what have you. And so it's up to Diana and Richard now to decide what. And they don't watch me quite as close. So that's, good. Well, that's good. I really appreciate it. I'm just thankful to be back. I'm thankful for, you know, um, when he told mm -hmm. me uh, for Thursday, I guess, I saw that surgeon, mm -hmm. and he said, as far as he's concerned, no more chemo. Mm. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> he got everything. I think he, along with a whole bunch of extra stuff, probably. <laughs> and um, then they damaged the nerve in my right leg. So that's why I'm on that walker mm -hmm. until I can. It's coming back. Good. I haven't totally lost it yeah. now, but Great. it'll just take a while. Praise the Lord. So I'm thankful Thank you. for that. Let's give the Lord a big hand yeah. for that. And uh, Daryl is, uh, is, is coming along, and I think he may be planning to be here next week. Uh, mm -hmm. if no more setbacks. Who else do we need to lift up this morning? Leon. Leon is recovering. And uh, Marianne had mm -hmm. some, a procedure, and so we need to uh, pray for her recovery. Yeah, you probably need to pray for Ken more than me, but... I can. <laughs> <laughs> I did see Bev this week. Um, she looks good. She she was wanting to go home and check on her car and spot, but I, I told her I checked on both and they were fine. And um, of course now you can go in the green room and visit. Right. Uh, but you're about you're more than you're like ten or twelve feet away, and so I'm screaming and <laughs> so she can hear me and. So it's a little bit of an awkward visit, but yeah. I think she's, she's always glad. She talks about all of her cards she gets and how much she enjoys that. Yeah, great. And then we need to keep Gary and Jean yep. still in our prayers. I mean, he's, as far as we can tell, he's doing as good as he can do during uh -huh. the treatment. Good. But it's pretty intense. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think his hope was just some improvement, some, something, you know. Mm -hmm. I think they worked real hard, right, Connie, on the nausea uh, yeah. from the chemo. It, it, was, it was better. The chemo was better for him this week Good. than the first round because it was horrific. But uh, yeah. His reaction to that first round of chemo, but it was better this time. They had a, a nausea patch they were able mm, to yeah. use for him that helped. Good. Like so, Gary and Jeannie. Mm -hmm. Any others? Yeah, I'll need a. Jimmy, we have been blessed this week because Kelsey was in a terrible wreck, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, she was uninjured, praise the Lord, and um, I just want you to please pray for her to have good driving skills, and God to keep his protective hand upon her, she's, she's such a blessing to us. Yeah, we didn't hear about it till a couple of days later, and it's a good thing because Grandma would have been, you know, yeah. there. <laughs> Any others? Not only to say a link to use your prayer to you know, just Lois. <laughs> okay. I'm very blessed that Lois wants to hear, but we're also miss her so bad. Yeah. One of the times, yeah. she can do about anything, and nothing ever bothers her. She can have. 50 people come into her house and unexpectedly, and she can still set up meals and like anything. She's just going to be rolling in there. Thank Ronnie you. And her two children, Rhonda and Ronnie Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm also thinking of uh, Carly and Bowie. They show improvement, and then maybe they'll come and they'll be sleeping, and, and uh, we go backwards just a little bit, but. Um, it's such a blessing to be able to have those little babies there every day. I love it. And, uh, and I'm just that the Lord will give them good concentration and comprehension and that they will have um, the strength they need to, to hold up. All 
all the children for that matter, and finish this year strong. Any others? If there are no others, you're always welcome to join me here at the altar if you'd like to lift these prayers or any that you have on your heart today. You're welcome to join me here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love and your grace, for your healing, healing of mind or body or spirit or all three. We thank you, Lord, for your evident healing on Lily May. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to heal her. We pray for Daryl and Leon and Marianne as they recover. May that recovery be blessed by your healing and by your comfort and peace on their hearts as they go through this time. We lift up Bev to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all who have expressed their love for her and that she receives it and knows that she is loved. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would continue to guide us and lead us to show the love that you pour into us to her. We lift up Gary to you, Lord, as he goes through this difficult time. And I praise you, Lord, that uh, they have found a, a little more comfort in his treatment. And I ask, Lord, that that treatment would be effective. And we pray for Jeannie as she faithfully stands at his side and takes care of him during this time. We ask, Lord, your healing and so many ways in that situation. We give you thanks, Lord, that Kelsey was uninjured and that you uh, kept her safe and just ask, Lord, that you would keep her safe and all of our uh, children who are away from home at school. Keep them safe, Lord, as they, as they go through their days. We lift up our students, all the students, May their hearts and their minds be open to learn what you would have them to learn and to discern what is not in your will and in your purpose. And that through their learning, may they come to glorify you. And Lord, we lift up a family who has lost a loved one. We lift up Lois's family. May they remember her and those memories be fond. May they live out the things that she taught them and the things that you shared through her with them and honor her life. And I ask, Lord, that you would comfort them. We honor you for your hope and your promise through our Lord Jesus Christ. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would hear our prayers that, known only to us, that uh, we need to lift to you. We ask, Lord, that you would hear those now as we lift them to you in this moment of silence. Heavenly Father, we pray all these things in the name of our Lord, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will once again acknowledge and celebrate our time of giving as we join in our offertory verse and we'll sing sanctuary and then the dox stand for the doxology. So let's join together in our offertory verse. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Deuteronomy 16:17. Lord, we do give you praise for all the gifts and the good things that you have poured out on us, especially those things that we never see, but you, through your love and grace, bless us with. We ask, Lord, in this time that you would receive what we have brought to you. We know, Lord, that it's hard to do that in the proportion that you give to us. But we pray, Lord, that you would receive these gifts back to you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful and use these funds in the way that you have designed to bring forth the good news of Jesus Christ into this community and into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, remain standing for the reading of the gospel that this week comes from the 21st chapter of Matthew. Verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did his father will? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and the instruction it brings to us. And today, Lord, may we open our hearts and our minds to your word. Come, Holy Spirit, lead us through these words that we may know what you know that we need to take from it. To place in our lives to understand you better and to serve you even more completely. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is a tough, kind of a tough passage. Jesus is talking pretty tough here. But he's getting down to the basics because you see he's about to be crucified. Just before this, he has entered Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday. You remember that Sunday? Uh, I hope you remember it. You know, that was like the first Sunday almost that we couldn't meet anymore. Do you remember that? That seems like a long time ago. I had the palms ordered. I, you know, they were here and, and, and we never got to use them. But it's after that. He enters the temple. We know that he cleansed the temple. Remember, he cleansed out the money changers and the, and the buyers and the sellers. And they were selling pigeons and, and, and uh, lambs to be slaughtered for the Passover. Because uh, families could do that. They could, they could go in together on a lamb or they could buy pigeons. Something had to bleed for their transgressions at the Passover. Little did they know that the Lamb of God had entered the temple. And there he was teaching. And we're told that the chief priests and the elders, that would be the Sanhedrin, that group of men who ruled the religious part of the culture and the society. And actually, they went past that. They were pretty political, too. Even though we know that Herod was their king, Herod really wasn't a Jew, but he was placed there by Rome as their king. But nobody really did anything without approval from the Sanhedrin. As a matter of fact, you remember that in the Passion, it starts there and then goes to Herod and then Pilate. And so these men come to Jesus after he's cleansed the temple, after he's driven all those people out, and they say, by what authority? We didn't give you any authority. Did Herod, Herod give you authority? Did Pilate give you authority? By what authority have you done this? And the thing is, what Jesus points out to them is, even if I tell you, you won't believe it. Because John came and you didn't believe him. And you, you get this little dialogue that goes on there when he asks him, you know, okay, what about John? Was what he said from God or was it from man? And they don't want to answer because they, they, they see that they're, they're kind of painted themselves in a corner there. That either way they answered, there might be something politically happen, a ramification. And so they're more worried about that than they are really expressing the truth or, or acknowledging the truth or believing the truth. And, you know, the, the thing is, is it's not, this, this scenario is not sent, uh, placed just for this moment. It's something that the church has struggled with through the ages. The church at one time was very political, and, it, you know, it still has political ramifications. But, you know, back in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church, I mean, it ruled. And what Jesus is saying here in this context is, you look at the law. You see, they followed the law. They believed they were righteous because of their observance of the law. Now, we, when, we, when I say the law, you might think of those Ten Commandments. But you see, they had extrapolated 613 laws from those ten. And a lot of them were in the spirit of what the law was given, but a lot of them were just human origin, as Jesus put it. And what they failed to see was the law was given in grace and love and truth by 
God. The law was about relationship. If you look at the, those Ten Commandments, the first of the commandments are about a relationship with God. You'll not have any gods before me. You'll observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You won't use my name in vain. And the, and the, and the rest of the law is about relationship with one another. You know, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. And so Jesus is saying, you've missed the point here. And you're leading this whole bunch of people, God's people, down into a rat hole because you are more concerned about your political standing and your standing as a priest than you are about the truth of God and the grace and love and truth of God. Well, you can imagine, you know, that didn't set well with them. As a matter of fact, you know, they'd been, we're, we're told, you know, especially in the Gospel of John, that since the time that he raised Lazarus from the dead, uh, they, they conspired to kill him. It's almost like, you know, okay, we're okay with you feeding 5,000 people or 5,000 men and their families. We're okay with you, you know, healing a blind man, but raising somebody from the dead, that's where we draw the line. You know, we got to get rid of this guy. But we are told in Scripture that this one would come with great authority, that he would be designated as one with authority. We read it in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is that chapter in Isaiah that is, you know, really, really messianic. It says, therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now listen to this. Why is he going to be put up the great? Because he poured out his life. Where does Jesus' authority come from? It comes from his sacrificial obedience. It comes from his love for us. That's why when he, he refers in Scripture uh, more than once that his glory will come at the cross. When he gave himself for the world at the cross, that's when he came into his glory. He tells uh, that to Peter and James. When they say, you know, when you come into your glory, we want to be on one side, you know, one on one side and one on the other. He says, you don't want to be anywhere near me when I come into my glory. He came in, and that's so contrary to what we would think. Jesus is dying on the cross, and that's where he comes into his glory. Why? Because that's when the love and the grace of God was demonstrated to the world. Through his sacrificial obedience and through that blood we are saved Amen. we say this around christmas isaiah 9 6 for us for unto us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace and then Jesus says this in Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18 comes after the crucifixion and the resurrection. He's saying, now, you see, I have all authority. Did he have the authority before? Yes, he did. But now he has proven himself. He has demonstrated to us himself. He has demonstrated to us in a way that generations, future generations will understand the Lamb of God has come and given himself for us. And by that authority, he has done this, these things. He talks about, you know, he's, I'm sure he's, especially got their ire when he said, you know, the tax collectors and prosecutes, prostitutes will get into heaven before you do. And what is, what is he saying there? 
He's not saying that they, those who uh, continue that activity will get in there, but what he's saying is those who have been humbled and realized their sins and have come and repented, they, they know what's going on. You have yet to learn that. Even though you consider yourself righteous and holy because you follow the law. If you read Paul, I mean, he talks a lot about the law. He talks about the death of the law. And what he's talking about there is people following the law rather than going to the grace of God. He's saying salvation doesn't come through the law, it comes through grace. For it is by grace, through faith, you have been saved. Not of your own doing. The gift of God. Now, I mean, we need laws, right? It's good to observe laws. But what he's saying is, that's not where your salvation is. That's not where your salvation comes. God so urgently needs us to understand it is by grace that you have been saved. And that's why he's saying, these people who were sinners and who you count as sinners and know they sinned, they cheated people, you know, they did immoral acts, they have come to know the grace of God. It's transformed them. In Luke, Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Say amen. Because we're all lost before we come to Christ. And I want to show you that too. In this list of characters, beginning with Jacob. Look at this list. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David was an adulterer. Jonah ran from God. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Uh, Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Moses was a stutterer. Not to mention that Lazarus was a dead guy. All these people God used. And they transformed themselves into a vessel that God could use. God worked on their spirit and worked on their souls and called them into use. And what does this say? He says, it says that God doesn't look for people that are following all this righteous stuff. I mean, he's glad that we observe, once again, the laws. He's glad that we live that life. But what he's looking for are people that know that they're imperfect and know that he's God and give themselves to him and his service. And all these people who had these imperfections did wonderful things for God through his grace and love on them. And he does the same for us. All of us here have something that we don't want anybody else to know. I'm just sure of it. But God knows. And the thing is, God still loves us and his grace is still upon us, no matter what we've done. All he asks for us is to repent and be transformed, move out of that. I mean, he did it to, to Lazarus in a big way, didn't he? He brought him back from death to life. But what an analogy that is for us, because all of us, no matter where we're at, no matter what we've done, no matter what sin we've committed, he brings us out of that death into life. And then that's when we observe the law. Once we know the grace of God, once we know the love of God, then we begin to live those lives growing closer to his likeness. What Wesley called, again, moving toward Perfection. I keep having to check my phone because that clock is uh, quarter till nine and I think it's going to be that way for a while. <laughs> Speaking of which, I didn't know this till yesterday when I was watching the news, but did you know yesterday was the autumnal uh, 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 equinox? Yesterday, we had 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. And guess what that means? <laughs> it means we're going into the darkness. But here's what I, the point I want to make about that. 
when these men who followed the law and saw their righteousness in the law, what they believed was if they could keep this balance between the bad things they did and observing the law, they were okay. And so that's why uh, Paul is such, you know, he, ta- he tells us that the law, uh, you know, is, 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 is enslaves you, it, it changed you. And that's, that's what he's saying is people spent their lives trying to do, observe the law so that they could counterbalance the sins that they committed. And he says, no, it's by grace. It's by grace that you have been saved through the blood of Jesus. Praise be to God. In Psalm 22, uh, some of you heard me preach that around Lent. And I was thinking, you know, there again, talking about Palm Sunday, it reminded me that the last time we met together was the Sunday evening service here, the Lent service. You remember that? That was the last time we met uh, before we went into, you know, isolation or whatever. And, and we were, I was worried that nobody would come, you know, because at that point, people, they were saying, you know, don't get together. And I think they said, don't be in crowds more than 150 or something like that. And, you know, we were about full, you know. But in especially Good Friday, you'll hear me talk about Psalm 22, because if you read Psalm 22, you will see the passion. You know what the first verse of Psalm 22 is? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it goes on. And if you read through that, you'll see everything that happened in the crucifixion. And then this is the end of it. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All will go down to the dust and kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. That's good news. That's good news. That's the good news of Jesus Christ That Psalm 22 goes through all that passion and then it ends with this. But it's not over yet because he will be known through future generations because he has accomplished it. What has he accomplished? He's accomplished the sacrifice that needed to be done. And through that, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And through that, he can say, you're saved because you believe in me. You believe in the grace that I bring. Praise be to God and his Lamb, our Savior, Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you did give your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, Lord, for your law that was given in grace and love. But we thank you, Lord, first for our salvation brought to us through your grace and your love and through the blood of your Lamb, our Lord. Help us, Lord, to never forget it is by your grace. Help us, Lord, to Show your love and your grace to others by observance of your law. But to always know that our salvation comes through your grace, our Lord Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is the Old Rugged Cross, number 429. Let's all stand as we sing together.
Go now with the love of God and the grace that he brings, that brings us our salvation through our Lord Jesus. Go with that joy in your heart and that assurance on your soul that by his grace you are saved. And through that, may we live lives according to his will and his word. In Jesus' name, go. Amen.